get started. Welcome to another installment in our seminar series. Thank you all for joining us today, despite the slightly snowy weather. And for everyone online, thanks for joining us. I think we have a pretty good showing um, on Zoom. Feel free to use the chat if you have um, any difficulties in hearing us or seeing us at any point, we can address that. Um, before we start, I'd like to take a moment to do land acknowledgement. Um, uh, acknowledge that Queens is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, and that we're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. Um, we today have Dr. Christian Larson, um, who's here to speak to us about a GIS-based approach to estimating potential agricultural pesticide exposure at the population level in Canada, which uh, I selfishly am very interested in hearing about because I think environmental health is one of those things that often falls to the wayside in terms of public interest, but it actually has huge potential health ramifications. So I'm very curious to hear what he has to share today. Um, Dr. Christian Larson uh, is a research scientist at Health Canada, a senior investigator at Carex Canada, a sessional lecturer at the University of Toronto and adjunct professor at the Toronto Metropolitan University. He has interdisciplinary training in medical geography, environmental epidemiology, urban planning, and environmental studies. His research uses geographic information science and quantitative spatial methods to examine the relationship between the environment and health with a focus on cancer and chronic disease prevention. The goal of his work is to produce evidence that may ultimately be able to be used in policy to create healthier, more livable, equitable, and sustainable communities while reducing chronic diseases. Christian has a few themes to his research portfolio, including children's independent mobility and active sustainable transport, environmental exposures and cancer prevention, indigenous health and equality, inequalities in access to healthcare. Christian has over 45 peer reviewed journal articles in leading public health, medical geography and environment journals. So I will hand it over to you. Um, we'll save questions for the end and feel free anyone on Zoom, use the chat to ask your questions or you can, um, I don't know if we have the audio set up. For them. Yeah, we do. So uh, if you wanna ask, uh, live, you can at the end as well, um, but we'll we'll save it to the end. Do well, I have to share it? You have to share it. Okay, so how do I? I only have one screen here, so. Yep. Nice. Yeah, but I'm just waiting for it to. Okay, thanks everybody. So, uh, the title of my talk today, IGS Approach to Estimating Potential uh, Agricultural Pesticide Exposure in Canada, Population Level. Um, so, outline for today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit, just a minute about who I am. There was already an introduction, but just a, just a little bit more about who I am. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Carex Canada. And some of the work I've done was with Carex Canada. That was my previous role uh, prior to moving to Health Canada. I was a research scientist at, at Carex Canada, and I am still, I'm now a senior investigator. So I'm kind of taking over a leadership role on, on the environmental side of the project. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, what are pesticides? Some of you may know, some of you may not know. Uh, why do we care about pesticides? Why do we care about looking at pesticides and how does it relate to your health or how might it relate to your health? Um, what did we find today? And then some kind of challenges and next steps. Uh, and then a, a few minutes, hopefully, for questions as well. So who am I? So um, as the introduction said, I, I look at environmental health. So my, my research is, is broadly focusing on environmental health. Um, I focus mainly on kind of cancer and other chronic diseases um, with a preventative lens to, to try to prevent these from happening. Um, I do kind of have four themes to my research, which we've mostly discussed already. Um, what we're talking about today is more related to environmental exposures and cancer preventions. Um, but what I do is I use GIS and spatial analysis to look at methods or approaches that we can examine the environment and either health behavior, uh, health exposure, or health outcomes, those types of things. Um, so as I said, I'm now a research scientist at Health Canada, but prior to that, I worked at Carex Canada. Um, and what Carex Canada is, is it's a multi-institutional team of researchers and specialists. Um, we're based in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. CAREX stands for carcinogen exposure. So the whole idea is looking at carcinogens and what you're exposed to. Um, the purpose of CAREX is to provide kind of a, a body of knowledge about Canadians' exposures to known and suspected carcinogens. Um, so I'll talk about what known and suspected carcinogens are as well. Um, but the priori priority here is to kind of uh, uh, emphasize exposure reduction policies and programs. 
So what do we do at Carex Canada? We look to identify carcinogens that Canadians are exposed to both in the environment is, is my side of the project, uh, but also occupational exposures as well. You can't look at those in silo. Um, you will be exposed at work and in the environment. So we look at kind of both of those particular exposures. My side of the project is, is we're looking at environmental exposures as an environmental health researcher. Um, and then we look kind of in Canada, where do these exposures occur? How many people are exposed and how much are they exposed to? Right, because the, the level of exposure also matters. Um, the vision here is to help reduce Canadians' exposures to carcinogens and reduce the risk of cancer. Um, so Carex Canada is funded by almost, not fully, but primarily funded by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, or CPAC. So what, I'm talking about carcinogen cancer. Why do we care about this? Why, why is this so important? Well, here's some statistics from the Canadian Cancer Society. So cancer is now the leading cause of death in Canada and has been for 20 years or so, um, compared to other countries where heart disease is still the number one killer, cancer is uh, kind of the big hitter here. Um, what's really important here is nearly half of Canadians in their lifetime will develop cancer. Um, so 44% kind of overall, or 45 for male and 43 for female. Um, so about half of these cancers could be prevented through healthy living, healthy behavior, um, and reducing exposures to protect health. Canadians. So that's why it's so important is we can we can drop these number of cancers down by preventing it through you know healthy behavior, uh, but also reducing exposures in the environment and uh, at work. So what are we talking about here today? Um, so this is work I completed almost two years ago. Now you're in a you're in a oh it feels like yesterday, but it has been <laughs> probably a year and a half. Um, so this is uh, published in environmental research. Um, so this paper essentially is doing exactly what I'm going to discuss exactly what we're talking about here today, looking at using GIS to, to estimate exposure. So pesticides, what are pesticides? So pesticides are actually really commonly used in agricultural practice. Um, they're used to, for, for multiple purposes to um, improve cosmetic conditions of the, of the crops, to control pests, um, and to just overall improve your agricultural productivity. The problem is there's been more concerns arising due to modern agricultural practices using large amounts of pesticides on our food. So what are pesticides? So pesticides is kind of a general term. And what that term describes is, is what's called active ingredients. Active ingredients are the pesticides themselves that are used to protect crops or help crops grow or whatever it might be. So examples of pesticides, active ingredients would be things like glyphosate, 2,4-D, um, and I'll talk about a few of those here today. So in Canada, you can't just use anything you want as a pesticide on your crop. It actually has to be approved and regulated by the PMRA or the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, which is an arm's reach kind of branch of, of Health Canada. So there's over 7,500 products for use in Canada with over 650 active ingredients. So what that means is 650 or so active ingredients are used in different connections and different mixtures to create 7,500 products type thing. So pesticide exposure, what is it? How does it relate to exposure? Well, your exposure is going to be highest in an occupational setting because that's where you're touching and dealing with, it, with the pesticides. Um, but general exposure to the population happens every day through pesticide contact with pesticide treated foods, but also contaminated air, water, and soil. Geographical location or the spatial location plays a pretty important role here because residents that are closer to agricultural lands will have higher exposure to pesticides through that contact to the, the air, water, and soil, and not through just through dietary exposure. So dietary exposure is something, doesn't matter if you live close or far from any type of agricultural environment, um, you're going to have it through, through contact through there as well. So what about pesticides and health? So we've talked a little bit about what they are, how you're exposed to them. What about in health? Well, pesticide exposure may relate to certain cancer outcomes, and we'll talk about those shortly. Uh, reproductive health issues, adverse birth outcomes, neurological concerns, and other kind of more general health problems. Um, and there's mixtures of studies that say one, say the other for some of these different things. Um, so just because I'm saying this doesn't mean that there's a concrete link between them. It is, it is, it is hard to have um, definitive answers on some of these, but there, they have been kind of expressed that there may be a relationship between them. So for children, there's been extensive studies looking at pesticides in the health of children and OP pesticides, which is a, a type of pesticide that 
um, it's commonly used. Um, there has been some, some pretty, pretty solid evidence relating to increased oxidative stress and, and development of chronic diseases for children. Um, and then that proximity to the agricultural land has really shown that those potential risks are higher for children because they, they're exposed at a much higher level. So pesticides and cancer. So this is kind of the angle that I was really looking at this from. Um, how do we know if things may or may not cause cancer? Um, so we don't have to do this. Uh, this, this work is, is being done and updated regularly. Um, it's being done by the International Agency for Research on Cancer or IARC. Um, so what they do is they classify different substances, not just pesticides, but anything to define whether or not it may or may not cause cancer. So um, what's classified as a 2A is a probable carcinogen. Um, 2B is a possible carcinogen. There could also be a 3 classification, which means it's not carcinogenic or, or hasn't been defined yet. Um, and then there's a class one carcinogen, which means that is, yes, it causes cancers, things like asbestos, right? Things that we know a lot about, radon, those types of things that we know a lot about and, and the science is proven. So a 2A is a probable. So it probably does, but there isn't quite enough evidence to push it to a, to a, a class one. Uh, 2B is a possible, so it may, uh, but we're, there's a little bit more uncertainty there. So pesticides that are used in Canada are typically classified as 2A and 2B. There are some that are classified as, as known, um, but those are either banned or not commonly used. So I've said what IARC's classified. What about kind of more generally pesticides and cancer? Um, so there has been a, a bunch of work done, especially um, kind of more recently in the United States, there's a, a big study called the Agricultural Health Study. Um, what did they find? Well, they kind of reported no statistically significant link between uh, glyphosate exposure and cancer, but they did find an increased risk of uh, certain types of leukemia for those in those high exposure categories. And this is important because this is what we keep seeing in the literature is overall general pesticide exposure might not relate to anything, but those high exposure categories is where something might be triggering. So meta-analysis in the US, Canada, Sweden, and France also reported a link between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, overall, recent studies have provided mixed research. So just, I'm, I'm highlighting a couple of ones that have, that have found some pretty, pretty good evidence, but there's others that have found basically, yeah, we're not sure, um, there's, there's nothing here. But what is, is common is that high exposure. So if you're at a very high exposure, that's where something starts popping out. Um, so that's what I said here, a common finding is those with much higher exposure levels um, seem to be where we're seeing that relationship to cancer risk. So what was the purpose of the study? So we wanted to do a couple of things. First of all, it's really not known where people are exposed to pesticides. There's dietary exposure. That's exceptionally hard to uh, measure, uh, especially at a population level, because just because one person has um, high dietary exposure, the other person's diet might not, and they might live next door to each other. So that's not really an environmental, that's an individual. So there's no population level approach there. Um, so we were really trying to get at, you know, how can we kind of look at kind of overall in Canada, where are we going to see more use of pesticides, which then would somewhat translate to a proxy of, of potential exposure. Um, so we're trying to get at, you know, what, how can we estimate potential pesticide exposure across Canada? We looked at three commonly applied pesticides, and I'll talk about which ones those are shortly. So the objective was to really use a, a GIS-based approach, so geographic information science or systems-based approach. Um, to look at, you know, how pesticides, where pesticides are and where people are exposed. That gives us that angle of, you know, looking at kind of sp spatial um, kind of spread of where it's happening across Canada. So we looked at 2,4-D, glyphosate and chlorophyllol. I'll talk about those three pesticides and why, why those were selected here shortly. First, I just want to have a quick slide here on why are we focusing on agricultural usage? So I said, basically, we're looking at agricultural usage and agricultural lands. Well, Really, because if you look at the breakdown of all sales of pesticides in Canada, 71% of them are in agricultural land. So almost, um, almost three quarters of pesticide usage is for agricultural purposes. So that's kind of the, the heavy hitter when it comes to pesticide usage in Canada. And then why did we focus on glyphosate 2,4-D and chlorophyllol? The rationale here we could have picked other pesticides as well. And we kind of thought once we get this done, maybe we'll, we'll replicate this with other ones, which we still may do at some point. Um, but really it, it comes down to sales and higher classification. Um, so glyphosate and 2,4-D are both what are called herbicides um, and they're classified as a 2A and a 2B. They're also the number one and the number two 
as far as sales go, used herbicide in Canada. So they're just very commonly used, both of them. Chlorophalanol, on the other hand, uh, is also a 2B. It's what's called a fungicide. Uh, so it protects against you know, fungal uh, instances on, on crops. Uh, but this is actually the second most commonly used fungicide in Canada. But the reason being is, is the number one uh, doesn't have an IR classification. So we don't know if there's a link there to any sort of cancer outcomes. So we just excluded it and went to number two, which has a classification that we can look at being a 2B. So why focus on these three pesticides? I kind of already mentioned this, but they're most commonly sold um, or second most commonly sold and they're classified by IR. So I did say here that the most common, common, commonly sold fungicide in Canada, Manticope is not evaluated by our IR. So we really don't know what relates to it. So rather than to looking at something we don't know about, we're like, well, let's just exclude that one for the time. So where did we get our data from? How did we do this? So this is interesting because it actually uses three different publicly available data sets. So it's not like we had to go out and collect data or buy data or anything like that. It's just looking at data that we could get available to us and looking at estimating kind of where people might be exposed. So it looks at the types of crops being grown in Canada. So looking at which crops, why is that important? Well, pesticides are only applied to certain crops and different pesticides are applied to different crops. And you can only apply a certain amount of pesticide to other crops, otherwise the crops won't grow. So there's, there's kind of fairly strict kind of rules on how that can be applied. So it's important to know what crops are being grown. I've, on the along the same lines, once we know what crops are being grown, we need to know how much pesticide is typically applied to that crop. Um, and then we also have to know where the people are living, right? So if we say people are exposed, well, if they're not living in that particular area, they're probably not exposed. So we have to also look at the population side of this as well. So that's population data on the number of people. So crop types. So this is just a kind of example of um, the spatial data set we got that had crop type data. So this is from Agricultural and Agri-Food Canada. So every year they put out what's called the annual crop inventory, which is what's called a spatial surface, which is basically a fancy word for a, a raster digitized um, picture that has spatial coordinates um, inputted to it so that you can actually look at what's happening and where it is. So this is looking at kind of south of Hamilton in the Niagara area. Um, obviously a rich agricultural area. Um, so looking at the different crops that we grow. And this isn't an inclusive list here, but you can look at them and see, okay, well, there's winter wheat, there's spring wheat, there's corn, there's orchards, there's vineyards, those types of crops and the different colors kind of pick up the different types of crops that are there. It's important to note that the spatial resolution is 30 meters, meaning each one of those pixels or cells represents a 30 meter by 30 meter area. So there will be some discrepancies, but that's a pretty small, um, spatial scale to be working at when you're thinking about a national level data set. So it's actually pretty, pretty good. Um, I get this question a lot too is, well, how do you know that this annual crop, crop inventory is accurate? It's verified every year as well through uh, provincial insurance companies and provincial ministries of agricultural to, to know kind of how, where those crops are being grown and how much of that crop is being grown. The average for the 2016 year when we did the study was 89.4%. Was um, they're typically range between 88 and 90 percent every year, meaning you're, you know, 90 percent accurate at estimating that crop being grown there. So it is, it is fairly accurate. So the next kind of data set we need is what's called application rate. So once we know where the crops are grown, we then need to know, okay, well, how much pesticide is going to be applied in those particular areas? This is challenging in Canada to get good data on agricultural application rates, good data on agricultural sales rates related to pesticides. All of this, this pesticide data seems to be fairly restricted in Canada. So we did have to rely on some US data sets, um, most notably kind of the chemical use program from the Department of Agriculture. We did pull some data together from uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. They did ha have some data available for some crops. So we used some Canadian data when we could get it. Uh, we used contacts at uh, at different provincial agencies as well to, to estimate those values. So we had some people tell us the application rates for some different crops. So we pulled together as many sources as we could, verified them, and then used those to, to, to estimate the amount of application of pesticides across space. Um, so this would give us a value of, you know, if you're growing corn, it's typically applied at a three kilograms per square kilometer of corn or whatever it is. So whatever that application rate is, that we know what's going on. Population is probably the least exciting. And the one everyone would know about is just using census data to determine where people are living. 
Uh, but it's important because, especially in rural areas, if, if there's no one living there, then we don't need to be as concerned about that direct exposure. So how did we, that's the data sets, how did we pull this all together? Um, so there were a lot of different crops grown. Um, so the easiest way for me to figure out how to do this was to basically write a code that would isolate each of these crops, calculate how many square kilometers of that crop are grown, um, and then add in the multiplier of how much application pesticide is applied to each square kilometer, and then you can kind of sum up, sum them all up once you put them all together. So what we did, that's basically the formula here is exactly what we did, but uh, the sum of all crops and then the application rates for each of the pesticides. So we do this three times for each pesticide. And then we roll it all up to the census subdivision. So that we get an average value or kind of a, a total value estimated per census subdivision. Um, why census subdivision? Well, it's kind of a small enough scale that you can see some variability, but it's a big enough scale that you can kind of pull in um, areas that have some agricultural land and some non-agricultural land, and kind of piecing it together to kind of estimate what's happening. So we had the total amount of pesticide applied within each census subdivision divided by the total acreage. Um, the results are reported as the total kilograms of pesticides per square kilometer of agricultural land. So for example, if we had you know, 14 kilograms of glyphosate applied to crops within a census subdivision total of 10 square kilometers, we'd have a value of 1.4 kilograms per square kilometer. Um, so this is using basically a, a estimated application rate for a proxy of potential exposure. So we don't know exact exposures. We're never going to know exact exposures. Even if we, unless we biomonitored everyone in Canada, we're not going to know um, exact exposures. But it gives us an idea of how much pesticide is being applied in those particular areas to kind of estimate, okay, well, this is, this is a good idea of where people might have higher exposure versus others. Um, so this, then we can sum up, you know, how many people live in these particular areas. We broke that down into quartiles just to say, in this province, you know, most of the population is living in that low exposure category or most of it's in the high exposure category. So broken into quartiles to look at um, potential exposure. So I'm gonna break down kind of three different maps here. Um, so I have three maps for E1 for each of the pesticides. You'll notice that the 2,4-D and the glyphosate one looks similar. The reason being is they're both herbicides, both apply to similar crops. So it isn't shocking that they look similar. Chlorophyllanol has a slightly different look to it. So the map you're looking at here is 2,4-D. Um, the darker red is your kind of high exposure quartile. Your light pink is your low exposure quartile. And then your grays are nothing, basically, or uh, no data. Now, nothing doesn't mean that there's, you're never going to experience pesticides. It just means that it, there's no uh, agricultural land to any degree. Uh, or not enough agricultural land to really uh, classify anything as exposure. So what you notice from this is 240 is actually much higher in areas where cereal crops, potatoes, and fruit are kind of more commonly grown because they have a high application rate of 240. You see a lot in the prairie provinces, kind of Prince Edward Island and Southern Quebec. That's where you start to see that higher exposure, higher potential exposure. How does this break down to people and where are Canadians exposed and how does this work? Um, so what's really interesting here, remember when I started talking about pesticides and cancer, I said that high exposure category is really the only one that, that seems to be somewhat concerning. Um, so breaking this down into, in Canada, who is the highest exposed? Uh, so in that highest exposure quartile, we have basically 2 million people in Canada living in that high exposure quartile. That amounts to about 6% of the Canadian population. Um, in this instance, PEI had the highest proportion of its population in that highest quartile because we had almost 70,000 of 142,000 people. So almost half of the people in PEI are in that high exposure category. As far as number of people goes, it's 70,000. So it, it's, a, it's a low number, but it's a high proportion. Um, kind of opposite thing for Quebec, where we have almost 1.4 million people in that high exposure category, um, but that's not a large proportion of their population at, you know, over 8 million. So, you know, we're not, it's a, it's many, a lot more people, uh, but the proportion is, is much lower. Glyphosate, fairly similar to the 2,4-D. Um, glyphosate is, is applied quite heavily to canola, uh, wheat, and corn. So where those are, are quite commonly grown, that's where you start to see the higher exposure. 
prairie provinces in general, along with some of Southern Quebec again, um, you start to see that higher exposure category. Again, about 2 million people in that high exposure category. For glyphosate, there's not one that really stands out as, I mean, Quebec again has the highest number of residents of exposure, but what's interesting here is if you look at the prairie provinces, especially Manitoba and Saskatchewan, you get, you know, 85 or 76 percent of their population is above the median exposure. So that means quartile three and quartile four. Thankfully, most of that exposure is happening in quartile three, but you can see that particularly based on those crops that, that you're looking at or being grown in that particular area, um, that, that they're above average exposure um, in those provinces. Chlorphalanol is a little bit different in the sense that it's applied to different crops. So the results actually look a little bit different. Um, you kind of drop out most of Southern Ontario. Um, you still see kind of a cluster of certain areas of the prairies. You start to see more of a cluster in Southern BC uh, related to the fruits grown there. Um, and then a, a kind of a large dark area in parts of New Brunswick and PEI where potatoes are heavily grown. So chlorophyllanol sees a lot of potatoes. Um, so those high kind of potato growing areas is where you start to see it. So root crops such as potatoes, along with certain types of fruit and chlorophyllanol is commonly applied. So Southern BC, PEI, Southern Quebec, and parts of Saskatchewan all have that kind of higher than potential exposure area. How does this relate to number of people? Um, so again, we have, we're down to about, you know, 1.5 million people, 5% of the Canadian population. So a lower proportion of the Canadian population in that high exposure category. BC had the highest number of people in that top quartile at, at almost 1.2 million people. Um, so Quebec kind of drops off in this instance. Again, though, PEI had, you know, 90,000 almost of their 142,000. So 63% of their population is in that high exposure category. So a larger number of that population are heavily exposed or heavily potentially exposed to chlorophyllanol. And that essentially relates to the so much application of um, chlorophyllanol in potatoes. So what does this mean? Kind of what does this bring out? Um, well, people living near agricultural lands were predicted to have a higher potential exposure. Not surprising, that's kind of what we expected. Um, but what we didn't necessarily expect is where these pockets were kind of popping up. Um, so the big thing here is the total number of people exposed to PEI is quite low, but the proportion is, is quite high. Um, and I kind of said this here, but it relates to the number of potato and grain farms of PEI and the kind of importance of agriculture in that area. So Southern Quebec uh, saw a high number of people potentially exposed to both 2,4-D glyphosate. Um, it relates to a few different things, but one of them being uh, their higher population density in that areas near agricultural lands. So the number of people living in Southern Quebec nearby having that high density in agriculture. Um, same sort of thing in BC, where we started to see that for chlorophyllanol is the people living, you know, in Southern BC, very close to agricultural lands. Um, so when you have higher population densities in close proximity to large intensive agriculture, you can start to see higher people potentially exposed. Um, so like I said, this new pattern was observed uh, across Quebec for, for both 2,4-D and glyphosate. So what does this mean? Um, what can we get out of this? Pesticide exposure is really challenging. So there are all, all sorts of methodological issues for using epidemiological studies to look at pesticides and health. There's really a lack of potential data sources to estimate where you would be exposed. Um, so as I said previously, exposure for pesticides is one of those things that would vary a lot from individual to individual. So if you want to collect data, you only have a few different options to get it. You can look at self-report, so surveys of self-report. That would give you some kind of an idea of dietary consumption but you wouldn't know exactly how much of that is actually relating to pesticides based on the foods you're eating as well. You can look at contaminations in air, water, and soil. You can do actual measurements, or you can use biomonitoring in, in your own. Okay. The problem here is those are very effective methods. Some of them are a little bit invasive. Um, they're all very expensive. Um, and they're also very individual in nature. So just because I surveyed one of you doesn't mean that the person next to you is going to have the same results. You can't kind of generalize that to the general population. So it's important to understand that there are other, and they should be used in unison, we, we should get at that dietary exposure. That dietary exposure is very important. 
Uh, but it's one of those challenges of getting good data to work with that you could then kind of represent at the population level. So we don't know how else to do that. So this isn't the first study to use GIS. So GIS uh, has been used in a couple of studies in the US as well to try to estimate how much pesticide is actually being used in their populations as well. And at a much different level, it's state level, um, not the national level, and, and only looking at kind of one pesticide in, in particular areas. But this kind of expanded on the previous work that's been done in the past, kind of look more generally at the national level, where are we seeing more potential for pesticides entering our kind of air, water, and soil based on more being used? Um, so there are some limitations associated with this as well. I probably could have a few pages of limitations, but it gives us a better idea of where pe more pesticides are being applied in Canada um, so that we can try to get some estimate of what's happening. Now, we're only measuring application rates. We're not saying this is the actual exposure. This is how many people are exposed. This is this is their exposure rate. We don't know that. We are estimating this based on a proxy of how much is being applied. Um, again, this is potential exposure that's being put into the environment, mostly kind of air, but then also water and soil to some degree as well. It doesn't account for dietary ingestion. So really we have to look at both to get a better understanding. Dietary ingestion is, is something that is necessary to kind of get at that, what are pesticides doing to your health type, type avenue. Um, and again, the number of people potentially exposed may be over or underestimated. And this relates to the fact that if you're not home, you're at work, well, those pesticides are applied. We're still thinking you're living there because based on the census, you live there. Um, it also could relate to, we're looking at census subdivision. Your house might be tens of kilometers away from uh, where that agricultural land is, but then you're kind of rolled up into it because it says you live there. And, and these are just limitations that we have to live with. We couldn't really roll it down to a smaller spatial, spatial scale. It's just at the national level, it becomes a little too crazy. We could do that if we wanted to focus on one particular region. For instance, if we just wanted to look at NAGRA or PEI or those types of things, we could do kind of more fine-tuned analysis. But at the population level in Canada, we have to kind of take those limitations and just roll with them. So um, estimates for potential exposure to pesticides in agricultural areas, at least we now know a little bit about where people in Canada might have or might experience that higher exposure. So it's adding to that kind of, I say growing body. I think there's now three North American studies using GIS to look at pesticide exposure. So it's trying to grow that, uh, that, that body of literature. Um, we focus on kind of national and provincial scales, but like I said, more fine tuned analysis would actually be interesting because we could look at that smaller spatial scale and we could follow that up with some survey data or other methods to get a better understanding of you know, how bad or how is exposure actually worse in that particular area. Um, and again, while pesticide application rates do not translate directly to exposure, it does kind of provide population level estimates to identify areas of concern. And that was kind of the goal here. We knew we we're not gonna get at how much people are actually physically exposed, but it gives us an idea of where exposure might be higher, um, where we might wanna kind of do some more work moving forward. So I just wanted to thank my, my co-authors as well. And this work, like I said, is, is done with CARIX Canada, uh, which is funded by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. So that was the, the funding agency for this. Um, and then we also had what's called a pesticide advisory committee. So while we were doing this work, we actually consulted with some other experts that work on pesticide. Um, and they were very helpful along the way to, you know, verify the approaches we were taking, making sure what we were doing was was uh, appropriate. So just wanted to thank the Pesticide Advisory Committee as well. And just one last thing here, I think I have a minute or two left uh, before I'm out of time is I focused today on the environmental side of it. We also did an occupational study looking at occupational exposure to pesticides. I didn't have time to talk about that today. Um, but if that's something of interest to you, I'm happy to share that study as well. Um, like I said, at Carex Canada, we look at both environmental and occupational exposures. So not looking at them siloed, but looking at them together makes a lot more sense as well. So there's also uh, an occupational side of the study where you can say, you know, if you're a farm worker in this particular, if you're uh, spreading the pesticide or even just working on a farm or all the different categories of, of agriculture um, industry, um, we broke down approximate exposures for those three pesticides as well. So there is an occupational study that's published as well. And I put a few different email addresses on the bottom. I checked all three of those. So you're welcome to use any of them. Um, if you have any more questions or want to get in touch with me after the fact.
So I did leave 15 minutes for questions. So that's, I think I still have that. I have 14 minutes, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Chat and on Zoom, I see some clapping. Thank you, colleagues. <laughs> colleagues always reliable for participating on Zoom. Thank you. Um, anyone here in the room or on Zoom with any questions? Yeah. So I guess I had a question. You you mentioned as one of the limitations that the census subdivisions, the area can be quite large. Um, and from my understanding, they will vary depending on the province and actually the more urban you get, the smaller they'll be. So I, it's almost opposite. It's a better estimate where the risk is lower, right? Is that like something you're like concerned about? So yeah, estimates? so census subdivisions are put together, trying to kind of pair together um, more equal populations, right? So it's, it's, there's a few different criteria put together. And, and this is all done, obviously, at the census level, and they adjust them at every census, but it's supposed to be somewhat representative of the same number of people. So you're correct to say that the, the urban areas, they're very small units or comparatively small units, but they also have a higher population. In them. And then at more rural environments, which we're looking at here, that's where you'll see, yeah, kind of more spread out population, lower population density. Um, there is variation in, in sizing. It's not like the rural areas are all the same size. There's variation that go with other factors as well. Um, but from an agricultural kind of exposure standpoint, most of those uh, really urban areas would be kind of excluded from the study in the sense that there is no agricultural land, so they would be excluded. So it's there's still going to be a range in the, in the more rural areas, but they're more all on the same plane. All right, thank you. I mean, it's never going to be perfect yeah. because it's impossible to be, yeah, no. um, which is why I kind of suggest we kind of look at a fine-tuned analysis of one particular area, and then we can look at a really small spatial scale. Thank you. question now. Dr. Larson, that was great. So two questions. Do you, what, how, how do you do the GIS mapping? Do you use like a computer arc GIS or I use RGS, yeah. So an out of the box program like that we all could learn because I think it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, so um, I use RGS. I, for this, I use what's called Python, which is a, a programming language. It's not just for RGIS. I'm sure other people have used Python as well. I mean, I use it to pull Twitter data, all sorts of different fun things you can use Python for. Um, but you can use it for GIS to, to animate some processes because I had to pull out all these different props across it. So rather than doing this point and click, you could do this point and click, it would just take longer. Uh, but you can definitely do it all uh, all using RGIS. And then my follow-up question is, I was waiting for any kind of correlation with cancer rates. I presume that kind of analysis is ongoing. Yeah, so I get this question all the time. Uh, I, I don't want to overlay cancer rates with pesticides just due to kind of the multiple causal effects of cancer um, and the limited knowledge of pesticides and cancer. So you know, methodologically, I, it's too ecological in nature to say, you know, this area had a high pesticide rate, and let's look at their cancer rates for those ones. That's too ecological to make that connection. Um, we have to factor in other things like latency of how long they've lived there and how long their exposure was, but also just, you know, other behavioral factors, other, other exposures as well that, that also relate to cancer. So I, I, I always get asked, can you, can you overlay? I could overlay it, but I physically won't do it because I'm just not comfortable uh, showing those results. That's good. I think that's really, that's very smart. Because um, people will draw those connections when they see them, but that doesn't, we run into that a lot with cancer cluster investigations in general, is this idea of uh, causality and looking for a reason why things cluster. Whereas we know random distribution means we're going to get clustering of rare cancers, but that doesn't mean that there's a causal. It's not statistically significant no. cluster. No. Well, actually, often that's the problem is that it would be considered statistically significant in that it's uncommon. And we wouldn't expect to see that by chance, but we're working on such a large scale that we are going to see things outside that 95% confidence interval of not being chance, but it's still chance. So. Yeah, especially with small populations. Yes. It's yeah. Basically yeah. You get, you get right. three, three of, you know, cancers or often with cancer investigations, you struggle with types of cancer, right? You were talking about Hodgkin's lymphoma yeah. or, you know, people will associate, well, there was a brain cancer and a lung cancer and a, and and a lymphoma, totally, but there's totally, totally different totally illnesses. Different. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They're just under that cancer umbrella. Yeah. There's no Nothing, relational effect. No, exactly. Yeah. Erica has a question. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm probably coming from it similar to uh, Sam with kind of a medical officer of health perspective on this. So two questions. Um, I'm wondering if you, um, I, I was a bit late entering, if you explain to the audience what a complete exposure pathway involves. Um, and secondly, I'm, I'm wondering in your role if you've um, uh, ever been approached by communities um, and just asked to uh, you know, do a community exposure assessment um, and if you have um, just had any anecdotal experience with that. Thank you. So we didn't talk uh, about exposure pathways um, here today. Um, something I'm happy to talk about, but didn't really have enough time to get there. So I just kind of talked about what we're looking at today, just looking at where, where people might be more exposed to pesticides um, and where it's kind of being applied uh, and just being kind of one avenue of potential exposure. And as far as the second uh, question goes, yes, uh, I have been count, uh, asked on multiple occasions to look at different exposure estimates um, or, you know, where people are exposed in the, in the community. Um, depending on kind of the, the ask, we will we'll put things together appropriately on what can be done or what cannot be done. I don't know if the wrong oh, there's so many cameras. I think that's our main camera for Zoom. But there's obviously people in the room too. Yeah. So, question to build off of, like, when you're talking about pesticide exposure, is there data on like how far the pesticides can travel in the air, water, soil? Like, when yes. you're looking at exposure. Yeah. So, in the in the paper, I actually have like the half life of it in air, water, and soil, and those types of things. Um, so, most pesticides will drift, and that's what's called when it's, when it's in the air, it's drifting. Um, there's different ranges of how far it drifts. Um, Again, I have some of that info. And before I even did the analysis, I tested different drift theorems of like, if it's gonna drift, say one kilometer, which would be a pretty long drift for a pesticide. It won't, it won't probably drift more than a few hundred meters. Um, how is that gonna change a result? So then I did a little sensitivity analysis. And it doesn't really change anything because once you're aggregating that up to the census subdivision, you're, you're losing all of that anyway. So it just kind of complicates the study and the results are basically the same. Um, great question. Um, and there is drift happening. I mean, there could be some instances where you're right on the census subdivision boundary and it might drift across the street. Uh, but again, it's when you're looking at it at this scale, it doesn't, we didn't find it to make a difference. But for fine tuned analysis, if you're doing, you know, small areas, that would make a, a pretty big difference because you, you'd have that variation. So Patrick on Zoom is asking um, if these exposure services I lost it too. Uh, could be applied to historical health outcome data from say 20 to 30 years ago uh, with shifting uh, pesticide application rates, spatial distribution. So yes and no. I mean, you could, if you had historical data on pesticides, you could estimate how how they were used back in time you'd also have to have historical application rates as well and how much was applied so there's there's a few different aspects there um along with historical outcome data yes but again you have to go through that where is the exposure happening how long are you exposed and are you living there long enough right if you're looking at you know a breast cancer diagnosis and your exposure from pesticides last year, well, that probably wasn't the causal effect. So again, I tread very lightly on, on doing these direct applications and more generally about reducing exposure because reduce exposure will reduce your risk, not necessarily looking at where that exposure is and, and what that caused you know, a year or two later. Yeah, absolutely. With especially cancer, it's so challenging because the exposures happen so long before or cumulatively depending on the type of uh, environmental hazard it's cumulative over time so where you live matters but where you get diagnosed might be different than where you were exposed say for instance you know if you grew up near a farm that was using lots of pesticides but now you live in toronto you're going to be counted as toronto but your your exposure that was yeah and it's hard here. to say whether that pesticide exposure on the farm or the diesel exposure yeah. on the farm or like the traffic exposure from in the toronto. city how yeah. long have you been there for so again the, the environmental health side of things is, is not as easy to classify as this is your causal. So we focus more on reducing exposures more generally, which will then hopefully lead to better outcomes, but not looking at that direct correlation between outcomes and exposure. 
Great quick question. Is yeah. your research on occupational exposure? Is that like published? We can it is published. Yeah. If you send me an email, I can share it to you. Oh. Did you say anything about like do, do occupational hazards associated with these three pesticides? Yeah, so occupational exposure is much higher. That's what I can tell you right, from, right up from the get go. <laughs> but you know, we're all waiting for the cancer, the cancer <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't give you that yeah. rank either. I, I mean, I can tell you from previous research as well that you know, more occupational exposure is more likely to find a, a, a causal relationship between, you know, or a, a more kind of concrete link to cancer than your environment. I mean, there are some very famous occupational exposures, you know, the, the people who worked in the, the dry cleaning industry, and, uh, yeah. you know, and then they asbestos. all got liver cancer. So yeah. you haven't seen anything like that? Asbestos would be a good one, yeah. Yeah, asbestos is a good one, yeah. yeah. You know, have you seen anything like, you know, specific cancers linked to specific exposures? It depends on the study you look at. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have found links, okay. um, but again, it's that really, ex really high exposure. So not yeah. overwhelming. No, or, or I mean, if it was that, if it, if this was an asbestos thing, they probably wouldn't allow it, right? <laughs> or eventually wouldn't allow it because okay. it, it took a us long time. a long the time with asbestos, right? right, right? So makes it tricky. Yeah. Is there any cohorts like? Do you know of say an agricultural worker cohort or something that we follow for uh, like cancer outcomes? Do we have any of those cohorts? In Canada, I don't know. In the yeah. U.S., there is. There is. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know if there is one in Canada that looks yeah. at specifically cancer and agricultural exposures. Yeah. yeah. So those, those are always nice cohorts. I know. I know. <laughs> With a 40-year cohort. Yeah. yeah. The dream. You mentioned that one of the challenges was like data availability surrounding application rates. I was just curious if you're aware of any like regions that regulate application rates or provide guidelines on like from that perspective of pesticide control so pesticides are one of those kind of tricky regulatory frameworks so the pmra does some regulation side of what can be used um, and then municipalities have a role as well on limiting pesticides so for instance cosmetic pesticides are banned in many communities um, but that's a community by community kind of policy um, so if you look at what's done in Toronto, it's going to be different than you know, what's done in Montreal or what's done in Kingston or wherever it might be. Um, so there are policy uh, rules there, but there's no consistency across the board. The PMRA does that from a, from a Canadian standpoint, but again, just for, for usage on what can be used, less so on you know, how much you want to apply. Now, pesticides aren't particularly cheap. So typically they wouldn't be applied at the recommended level. They wouldn't, they wouldn't apply, typically wouldn't apply more because that's just costing more money. Um, typically not applied at much less rate because then you're probably not getting the effectiveness from them. And, and so so they're, they are pretty standard based on what you are applying them at, based on what is recommended. That's it, we don't know for sure, but that kind of is the, the idea is that they're pretty close to what's recommended. But the policy uh, side of it is very complex. Any final questions? Yeah. Um, based on your findings, what sort of public health response or actions would you like to see taken? You mentioned a reduced exposure. Yeah. What? <laughs> Again, big question. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard to say what I mean. What we were trying to do here is kind of identify where exposure would be higher. So that then we could take the next steps of looking at okay well how how who's actually exposed so i would say more study is needed to know how much of this actually translates to direct exposure um and then what can we do to kind of reduce that and i'm not trying to say stop using pesticides because we need we need agricultural happening as well and we can't just you know push everything to organic food or whatever it might be i don't i'm not suggesting that's the answer it's just you know making sure that we're doing what we can to limit exposures in any way possible Again, looking further study to see how how bad how high is that exposure? Is that exposure high enough to, to cause anything? Because that, like I said, I broke that into high quartiles for Canada, but I don't have a comparative study to other places in the world where, where pesticide exposure is higher. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>
I'd like to remind everyone that our next seminar is Wednesday, February 8th, and we're going to have two speakers that day. Dr. Zihang Liu is speaking about um, identifying longitudinal respiratory phenotypes in the child cohort study, a machine learning approach. And Dr. Wei Tu is looking at machine learning based predictive modeling and risk factor identification with application to HIV AIDS. So, two excellent speakers. We would love to see you there. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>